Paramount, the parent company of CBS, is weighing multiple offers and which one they choose will radically impact the trajectory of the company. We're diving into that with CNBC's Alex Sherman. Plus, the Arena Football League is on life support and there is a bidding war over the NFL's Christmas games. It's Wednesday, May 15th. I'm Owen Poindexter and this is Front Office Sports Today. Three weeks into what was supposed to be the Arena Football League's comeback season, multiple teams have folded and the league itself might not make it through the year. The Minnesota Myth have shut down, as have the Philadelphia Soul. A TV deal with the NFL Network was canceled, and players and staff around the league are not getting paid. On Saturday, the Billings Outlaws took a five-hour bus ride to play the Rapid City Marshals, but that game didn't happen because the Marshals refused to come out of their locker room until they were paid. The Louisiana Voodoo have had two games canceled so far in the young season, which they attributed to issues that are, quote, completely out of our control. The blame for all of this is focused on AFL Commissioner Lee Hutton. Outlaws owner Steve Titus said recently that, quote, the best thing that could happen for the AFL right now would be if Lee Hutton resigns this instant as commissioner. All he has done as of late to team owners is lie. Marshall's owner Wes Johnson echoed that sentiment in an interview with local TV station Coda TV, saying much of his roster had quit because the league wasn't paying them and that Hutton, quote, needs to be taken out of his position. At this rate, there might not be much of a position to take him out of before too long. <laughs> To a more successful football league, the NFL has created a bidding war over who will steal Christmas. Recent reports came out that Netflix was closing in on the NFL's two Christmas games, but now Amazon is making a late bid to take one or both of them. Going with Amazon would allow the NFL to stick with a known quantity. Amazon would remain the league's sole streaming-focused media partner and claim another shopping-focused holiday to pair with its Black Friday game. Netflix, on the other hand, would represent new territory for both sides, it would add another member to the exclusive club of NFL broadcasters and would represent by far the biggest embrace of live sports by the streaming service, which to date has only dabbled around the edges, especially compared to other major streamers. The NFL is going to have its pick of two very different options when it decides what it wants for Christmas. Up next, the slow transition from cable to streaming has put legacy media giants in a difficult spot. Paramount, which owns CBS and many other networks, is weighing various bids to buy the company, while Disney is trying to offer ESPN to customers in every possible way that it can. CNBC media reporter Alex Sherman has been deep in the weeds on all of this for a long time, and he joins us next. All right, I'm joined once again by CNBC media reporter Alex Sherman. Welcome, Alex. Owen, always a pleasure. Yeah, always a pleasure and always plenty going on, I feel like, especially right now. Um, a few places we could start here. Let's start with Paramount is still maybe selling itself to someone. Uh, the latest I've seen is Apollo and Sony are interested in in spending something like $26 billion on acquiring Paramount. Just give me the, the lay of the land here. What's what's the deal with Paramount maybe being sold? Yeah, so I'll back it up, you know, to, I don't know, maybe roughly 10 days ago, two weeks ago, something like that, where uh, there was an exclusivity period that ended May 3rd with uh, Skydance Media, who was backed by two private equity firms, Redbird Capital and KKR. This was Sherry Redstone's preferred buyer um, because Skydance had orchestrated a deal where it would give a very significant premium to Redstone for her control shares uh, in Paramount Global, which she owns through a holding company called National Amusements that her dad started, uh, Sumner Redstone. And in addition to that, uh, the uh, Skydance Redbird KKR consortium had been working with her uh, under the constraints that they will not break up Paramount, which is important to Sherry Redstone and her family's legacy. She doesn't want to see this company ripped to shreds with job losses, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that made the deal a little bit harder, I think, for uh, the Skydance consortium to kind of uh, uh, get comfortable with, but they've been working on it for months, and they finally had more or less an agreement uh, that was ready to go. The problem was that the special committee on May 3rd decided to end the exclusivity window without reaching a deal. And so now we're in a mode, and the reason they did that, by the way, is that Sony and Apollo lobbed in an offer sort of at the 11th hour, uh, saying, hey, you know what, actually, uh, we are interested in buying the company, and Unlike the Skydance deal, which uh, paid out uh, some percentage of common shareholders a little bit of a premium, but kind of a low premium and not everybody, the Sony Apollo deal pays all shareholders, 
pays Sherry Redstone a little bit more, uh, and pays all shareholders at a higher premium than the Skydance offers. So if you are a common shareholder, the Sony Apollo deal is a much better deal for you. So the special committee is saying, well, we have an obligation to all shareholders here. So <clears throat> let's take a look at that bid and see if we like it. That's where we are now. There, are, There is some regulatory risk associated with that bid. Sony is not a U.S. company. It's kind of still unclear where all the money is coming from here. So if some of that money is foreign money, that might be a regulatory issue. Because Apollo is involved and Apollo owns broadcast stations, it's unclear if regulators would be okay with taking over the broadcast owned and operated stations as part of Paramount Global. So it's thornier than the Skydance deal. And it's possible the special committee could take a look at it and say, you know what? Too many regulatory obstacles here. We don't like that bid. And we recommend that we go back to Skydance now. We will take that offer because that offer is better than nothing, which would be the alternative number three. And by the way, nothing now includes a company that has no CEO. Because in the past few weeks, Sherry Redstone dismissed Bob Backish as the CEO of that company in what I said was sort of M&A war games at the time. So that's where we are today. Yeah, fascinating. In all this, I mean, I, I, I keep just kind of zooming out to, like, what are we buying here? And by we, I mean someone else with lots more money than me. But um, because I mean, we've talked about how... Like Paramount is, you know, it's not really equipped for the streaming era. Um, it's got some sports rights, but they're very expensive. And it's, you know, open question as to how worth it those are. Um, and I, I'm sort of flashing back and you tell me if this is, this is probably not a good comparison, but let me know how you feel to um, Sinclair buying uh, Diamond Sports Group uh, for close to $10 billion when it's, you know, they're buying a big package of regional sports networks when everyone could see that cord cutting was a thing and you know those rsns were just going to decline in value over time and um and they they got stuck holding the hot potato here i get some of those same vibes here but at the same time paramount is it's a legacy media company it's one of the oldest most established things in media so yeah are is are, are whoever ends up holding this are they going to be happy about it <clears throat> so I think there are some vibes that are similar to uh, the Diamond Sports deal. I would liken that deal more toward AT and T buying Directv, uh -huh. where it was just it was very clear like that business is not a good business anymore. Like it is a dying, slowing business. And so those two deals, I would say, is a little more similar. This one strikes me as you could at least rationalize it that the market has pushed down the value of the assets within Paramount Global, which actually are not that bad because when CBS and Viacom came together, that put a lot of debt on the deal. And now the company is out of whack financially. So actually the Skydance Consortium's bid is very much based in this idea that what the company needs is a recapitalization. They need a better balance sheet, a different equity to debt ratio here that puts the company on more solid financial footing. And that's the reason why the shares have, have, have come down so much in value, because investors have been freaked out by the ratio of debt to market cap. So if that's the play, then the reason that there are two bidders for this is that they actually see value, if you manage the company differently, uh, in CBS and in football rights and in a huge library, uh, you know, that includes like Star Trek and The Godfather and, and, and in a Paramount lot, even the physical lot has a lot of value, billions of dollars potentially hmm. in value. So you could come to a point of view where the sum of the parts here, even in today's world, would still make it worth it for one company to buy this thing. But I do think they would need to start divesting assets in order to get that value. And that is something that Redstone doesn't want. So I think if the sale does happen, it's going to be this dance if it goes with Skydance where they say, hey, look, you know, we agreed not to break up the company, but maybe as the years go by, we start to do a little bit of divesting. Honestly, people I've spoken to within that consortium say that is in fact part of the plan anyways. If, the, if not a wink, wink, then at least that's sort of an acknowledgement that, look, we're going to have to divest some things here. The interesting thing with the Apollo Sony bid, as the New York Times reported, last week is that they just plan on sort of tearing the thing apart, which is what you would expect from a private equity firm to do, right? 
But, you know, Sony wants the library, but they don't have any interest in Paramount Plus or CBS or Showtime or BET or a lot of these other assets. So that would be a real fire sale. And I don't know if Sherry Redstone would go for it. And we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, very interesting. Let's hop over to Disney, Spulu, ESPN. So I, I'm having legitimate trouble keeping track of everything Disney is trying to do, says they're doing. But uh, so they've got, you know, the Spulu bundle, which until it gets a real name, it's Spulu. So that is, you know, ESPN, um, Fox, Warner Bros. Discovery, and, you know, maybe other Disney properties as well. And now there's going to be a separate bundle. Is that right? With Disney right. Plus, Hulu, and Max. Also, ESPN Plus is still a thing, and ESPN is going to have it. So it's going to be a standalone streaming service, maybe, or maybe attached to one of everything I just mentioned. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it, it's, it feels like they have too many things going on here. Oh, what, what is Disney doing? Yeah, it, it reminds me of that time period where HBO had like HBO Go and HBO right. Now and HBO Max and. It was a consumer problem, and, and I think uh, like we're headed there for for Disney and ESPN. That there's going to be too many things, and to the to the regular consumer that doesn't follow this stuff <laughs> like intensely, there's going to be major confusion. I think on what yeah. they're getting with what. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's going to be an ESPN flagship streaming product that launches in the fall of 2025. There's this Spulu thing, which is basically just the linear feeds, cable feeds of some cable networks that have sports on them. But the main one is ESPN and some other Disney stuff like you alluded to. Um, and the point of that is that now I can access ESPN through this skinnier bundle of linear cable channels where I can pay less for it. We still don't know what the price is going to be on that. As opposed to the full cable bundle, which was the only way that I've been able to get ESPN for the last 40 years or so. So that's the motivation there. The announcement most recently uh, is that Disney Plus, Hulu, and Max will be bundled together. That is significant, less for the offering itself, which will be at a discount, but like, you know, whatever, sort of. Uh, and more for the fact that it's a, uh, I think it will be a catalyst for more cross-company bundling, putting together something that slowly starts to represent the digital cable bundle, but with streaming services instead. Which is where I think, I mean, I've been writing about this for years. Like, 2021, I went back and looked. It was the first time I wrote about this idea that we're kind of obviously headed to this streaming bundle. It's what everybody wants. There'll be one aggregator, whoever that will be. You'll be able to just, you know, talk into your remote and find whatever show you want. And it will just kick you to that service. We're slowly building that. It's taken a long time because the economics behind it are difficult. In other words... You know, Peacock has wanted to bundle with every streaming service under the sun, I've reported before. The difficulty in it is that all these other bigger streaming services have been like, well, wh wh what are we getting out of this? Like, you guys only have 30 million subscribers. We have 100 million, you know? So, like, if we're going to do this, we can't just have, like, a 50-50 split of the finances. We need to figure out some revenue share here that makes sense. That has really bogged down the discussions. Obviously, Disney and Max figured it out. Max is going to get some fee of the total amount of money for whatever this bundle costs. There will be an ad-free bundle and an advertising bundle. So obviously with advertising, it will be cheaper. Um, but yeah, to, to, the, to the bigger point here, I think Disney is going to have a consumer marketing problem on its hands. I get why they're doing this. They want to hit every consumer possible in whatever iteration there is. Uh, so they want to make a bunch of stuff available uh, and, and so that you as the consumer can mix and match to whatever your own personal tastes are. But you do get into a situation quickly where you end up confusing the customer. Yeah. And just to hammer this out, because I too am a confused customer. So come the fall, supposedly, assuming like this all works out, regulatory and otherwise, uh, you'll be able to get ESPN, just ESPN by as a streaming service. And also... Um, uh, also the Spulu bundle, which will include ESPN and some Fox stuff and some WBD stuff. Is that what they're doing? E ESPN flagship alone launches in fall of 2025. Oh, so okay. Spulu wow. comes out fall of 2024, where you can hmm. get the linear ESPN feed. In fall of 2025, you can just buy ESPN solo, and it will come with all sorts of other new bells and whistles 
like betting integration and fantasy integration and personalization that doesn't exist within the Spulu bundle. So if the reason you were buying Spulu was only ESPN, and I would say a fair amount of the people buying it, that's going to be the case, particularly if TNT loses the NBA. Because right. uh, like then, you know, they have some hockey and, and March Madness and some baseball, but that's it pretty much. Uh, then that might be an appealing product to you where you might you might try Spulu for a year, wait for the ESPN flagship service to come out. That will be cheaper than Spulu. And then you may say, you know what, I'll take this other ESPN product instead and ditch Spulu. Disney will probably get more money because all of the money will be going to Disney for the ESPN flagship service. So Disney will likely make that trade off. Otherwise, they wouldn't even launch ESPN flagship to begin with as a service. And then you've got ESPN Plus still hanging out there oh, yeah. for those customers that want like the ESPN light experience and like kind of like sports, but not really, or just really only like it at a $12 per month level or whatever it costs today. Yeah. I, I'm not sure who the ESPN plus customer is when, when all that's out there. And it sort of sounds like Disney is going to try Spulu for a year. And uh, you know, if people, enough people go to ESPN flagship, whatever they're calling that, then I mean, Maybe it doesn't hurt them to keep having Spulu out there, but like, I don't know. Yeah. Sp Spulu just, it's, I mean, everything from the name to, I don't know, just the the cloud of uncertainty that hangs over it. And they're selling ads for it too, right? I mean, at, at the upfronts, they're saying, you know, you'll be able, we've got inventory here yeah. for the service that has no price or name or, they, I don't, they don't have a launch date exactly. Do I mean, it's before the NFL season, right? Right. So, I, think, um, I think that's the idea for sure. It would yeah. certainly not make sense to launch that after the NFL season. But to your point, I 100% think you're right. Now, this is sort of a test for Disney. Let's see this product. How many people are going to subscribe? It's a failure. Well, we've got this other thing in the background like that will launch. I, 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 think, I think it's notable that Spulu is one-third owned by Disney, one-third owned by Warner Brothers Discovery, and one-third owned by Fox, even though Disney is contributing ESPN, which is by far the biggest draw. So, well, why is it one-third, one-third, one-third? Well, my guess is that Disney doesn't really expect this thing to be that big of a deal. So, like, whatever. Like, we'll get the incremental revenue and we'll move on with our lives. All right. Words to live by. Alex Sherman, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Alex. That's it for today. Subscribe wherever you're listening and hit the like button if you're on YouTube. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.